team i welcome all of you for today's webinar in data science webinar series organized by human atlas mano human atlas initiative myself dr salesh kumar moderator of today's call today's talk as you all know that uh, the total allotted time for today's webinar is 1 hour out of which talk will be by the speaker will be of nearly 40 to 45 minutes then we will have a question answer session of about 15 minutes i request all part shalish there is an internet connectivity issue uh we we cannot hear you at all okay i think uh, there is some internet connectivity issue um, with uh, dr sajesh uh, he was just uh, requesting all the participants to kindly put in the questions in the q and a tab which is there on your screen and uh, uh, we will uh, be also sharing the link for the feedback of the session and please do post your questions both uh, in which uh, you know uh, on youtube as well as in this session so please post your questions in the q and a section tab only because that helps us to collate all the information so uh, uh, a little introduction about our speaker today dr devarka sen gupta he is an associate professor of computer science and computational biology at triple it delhi he is also an honorary associate professor at the queensland university of technology brisbane his research group introduced single cell research in india uh, he is the he co-founded a singapore based edtech startup dcraft private limited and a delhi based cancer liquid biopsy company care onco biotech private limited he is a recipient of the inspire faculty award in the year 2015 so uh, with these few words uh, over to you dr devarka for uh, the session yeah yeah thanks a lot uh, sorry for the internet connectivity issue on dr shailesh's side and uh, thanks for rescuing the introduction uh, so happy to be here um it's a part and parcel of our life these days since everything is happening online i hope i'm audible and visible both yes, is sir. it yes sir fantastic so Okay, I speak a bit fast, you know, because I want to cover a lot of things, and it the talk would be technical enough. So just uh, stop me yeah, if you were. You're audible. You're audible. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. So I'll just jump start with the talk. I guess, uh, Shailesh. Yeah, sure. um, yeah. All right. So the title of the talk is "Fast and Accurate Characterization of Single Cell Transcriptomes." and transcriptomes is a technical term uh, for gene expression profiles so my name is devarka sen gupta i am an associate professor of triple id delhi i have been working for the last four and a half years as a principal investigator uh, you know independently you may say so um, on um, you know single cell method development right i mean primarily my training is in computer science so i am a computer science engineer you can say so and um, and my interest is in uh, fundamental biology and translational biology and uh, most of my past works uh, you know have uh, revolved around uh, single cell genomics transcriptomics and cancer biology i'll not be talking of cancer today at all i'll be talking about some uh, you know uh, important uh, method developments which really accelerated the field of single cell transcriptomic data analysis and we contributed significantly as a group the the talk could be quite a technical talk so here's an alert but you can ask me questions at the end of the talk if there is any glitch or any technical error just uh, call me on my phone i have shared my phone number with the organizers well what is single cell single cell as you all know our body is made up of 40 trillion cells and roughly speaking and then the cells are very different phenotypically and if you look under the microscope right all the cells uh, you'll see look very different uh, even without doing any molecular profiling just by staining you'll see that the cells represent significant diversity and heterogeneity 
so the if if you are using a single cell uh, RNA sequencing or DNA sequencing, then you can look precisely at one cell at a time, uh, which is a significant advantage over looking at the bulk, uh, you know, tissue level uh, readouts, right? So that that's the that's the clear advantage of using single cell based techniques, and it has become quite a you know popular way of understanding and redefining, recalibrating some of the biological concepts that you have developed through our studies, right, over the last uh, hundreds of years, right? So so it's a, it's a new prism, right, for molecular biology. You can pretty much ask all the molecular biology questions through the lenses of single cell sequencing, right? And um, it helps you in the following things, at least. There are many other applications uh, which we'll not talk about, but uh, tissue heterogeneity analysis, primarily in the context of cancer, right, it is very important for one to understand that what are the different uh, heterogeneous cell populations, malignant or non-malignant, that are harbored by a tumor. And that helps uh, us in appreciating the, uh, the different treatment policies, right? Uh, unknown cellular states, uh, disentangling uh, differentiation processes, right? Uh, you know, the organ development you can, you can think of, you know, can be uh, delineated very precisely through single cell sequencing uh, data. And of course, you can discover previously unknown cell types. That's a clear advantage. Um, here are some anecdotal figures. They don't mean much unless I describe them. So I'll just move over it. Yeah, so the the, 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 the the right side figure here at the top you can see is the trajectory, right? The developmental states of uh, the, the neurons, right? And and you can uh, identify this uh, the trajectory using some uh, novel computational developments in the field of single cells. In the end of my talk, I'll talk something around it. But other than that, you can always see the heterogeneous subpopulations. You can characterize them, you can do the marker analysis, and you can... Uh, you know, specify how a particular cell subpopulation is different from the rest. What are the typical challenges of single cell uh, expression data? So if you look at the left, like this thin slice is, um, you know, representing a bulk rna -seq, representing a bulk rna -seq data where you have 20,000 genes uh, on the rows and a few samples along the columns, right? So you typically don't have too many uh, samples when you do bulk sequencing. Uh, whereas in single cells, you can imagine that you have too many cells, right? Uh, the, the largest data uh, sets today that we have are of sizes like 1 million or more, right? So there's a huge, huge matrix. And of course, you need to change the computational methods. And, and uh, the matter of the fact is that the data, the single cell data is extremely, extremely choppy, right? So you have a lot more dropouts, a lot of genes randomly disappear, you'll just see no expression at all. Uh, and, and the sequencing depth is also abysmally low. So given all these things, it's very difficult to be able to use the, the, the typical statistical methods that you created for bulk rna data analysis on the single cells. So what we developed as a very fundamental way of uh, representing a single cell is some kind of a zip code, right? So you can think of a pin code or zip code that basically tells you that gives an identity, a low dimensional identity to a particular location uh, otherwise, but in this case, it gives an identity to a single cell, right? Because single cell data otherwise is mammoth, right? It's very, very large, uh, you know, if you talk about uh, the, the largest studies, right? Now, how to deal with that? How to identify the cell similarity, the similarity, the heterogeneity, the rare cells, all these problems boil down into representation of the single cells in a very convenient and easy to access way. And this is the problem that we tried to nail first, right? When I started my lab back in 2017, right? So here's a very important piece of concept, which is developed by another um, Indian scientist. His name is, um, you know, Rajiv Mothwani. He, he was a professor, full professor of uh, Stanford University in computer science. He was the uh, mentor of the Larry and Sergey Brin, Larry Page, Sergey Brin, the, the co-founders of Google, right? So what he said was, if you have a high dimensional data point, so you can think of this red dot and the, the yellow dot uh, as high dimensional data points, right? And you can basically, right now I have no other choice but showing you this example on a two dimensional plane, but you can think of this two dots lying in extremely large dimensional space. 
And what you can do is you can randomly draw some hyperplanes in that uh, you know hyperdimensional space. And just by looking at which side of the hyperplane the data point lies, you can actually assign it a bit code, right? So if you look at these two points, there is only one hyperplane, which is this, uh, for which these two points are actually on the opposite side. For the rest of the uh, for the rest of the hyperplanes, they're on the same side. Therefore, just by drawing a few hyperplanes, typically 10 to 20 hyperplanes, you can actually crunch down these 20,000 genes uh, uh, into a smaller dimensional space uh, spanned by this bit vector, right? And each cell, therefore, be, uh, gets represented by a uh, you know, bit vector, which doesn't take you anything but randomly drawing some hyperplanes and then looking at which side of the hyperplane your point lies, right? And therefore, if I ask you what is the Hamming distance within these bit vectors, uh, it is just one, right? Therefore, there is a, you know, out of these seven uh, possibilities, right, only in one case, the cells were actually different, uh, differentially allotted the two different sides of the hyperplane, right? And therefore, um, the Hamming distance will be one in this case. And it turns out that the Hamming distance in this lower dimensional abstract space actually, uh, you know, mirrors uh, the cosine distance in the hyperdimensional space, right? Which is a remarkable result because it really helps you crunch down the large dimensional data points into uh, smaller dimensional representations. And the smaller is much, much, much smaller, like, right? It's like 10, uh, you know, uh, dimensions or 20 dimensions. And that too randomly, because when you do some operations randomly, you really don't need to write a lot of code. You, your, your computing time is very, very less, right? So that's a clear benefit. We sort of, we took it very seriously and we tried, started developing a lot of methods around it. And this is, uh, let me uh, tell you that this is a very sophisticated and fast uh, method for approximate nearest neighbor finding, right? Machine learning is all about finding, uh, you know, similarity and dissimilarity between two data objects, right? And therefore, if you can uh, reduce the burden of this task, right, the time consumption associated with this task into minuscule time, then it becomes really easy to solve any machine learning problem. Now, that's the concept of big data because it's applicable to only very, very large data sets, right? For the smaller data sets, you can do a brute force search. Who cares? So we developed a clustering solution because uh, when, an, when we were working on this problem in 2017 or so, so at that time, the fastest method used to take like uh, 20 minutes for analyzing uh, single cell RNA -seq data of a size, let's say 20,000 uh, cells or 30,000, 40,000 cells, it will be even higher. So, so that, that, that's a huge time. And it's not only the time, it's also about your considerations in your algorithm, which make you find the rare cell subclusters well, that helps you find the other unknown cells well, right? So we actually developed a lot of, it's an ensemble drop class switch, which is quite popular these days, and you can check out the papers. Uh, we, we sort of built it on some very uh, interesting, uh, you know, constructs, right? Uh, somewhat mathematical, somewhat algorithmic, but in the end of the day, what we did was, uh, in the initial version of Troplust, we actually developed a method of, uh, you know, uh, structure-preserving sampling. Uh, so this, what you can see here on, on the screen is um, a cohort of 68,000 single-cell expression profiles of uh, human blood cells, and uh, this is a two-dimensional representation of the same, what you do here is I just show you 500 cells or 1,000 cells marked on top of it. So the gray uh, dots represent the entire 68,000 cells, right? And, and the colored dots represent the ones that I'm showing you, which have been yielded as part of the subsampling of the, uh, of the data. And so the method that we developed is a structure preserving sampling method, which means that we first determine the clusters uh, with a rudimentary, uh, very basic method, is graph clustering. And from that, we preserve more, uh, you know, uh, cells from, um, uh, more cells from clusters, which are uh, of large size, right? For example, T cells are in plenty. Um, and, and dendritic cells, for example, are not, you know, that many, if you just randomly sample some blood cells, right? So uh, our idea is that the cells which are more in your data, you should sample them, you know, less frequently. Uh, and and if, you, if you have more uh, and less of particular kind of cells, such as dendritic cells, then you'll sample it more, relatively more. 
right? So it is governed by a simple, uh, you know, exponential decay function that helps you decide the probability of sampling. But what it shows is that, you know, uh, if you do a random sampling, then it, you can see that the, 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 for example, for the 500 data points, the random sampling would look something like this, if you can follow my cursor. Right, whereas the structure preserving sampling will look something like this. So in this case, you end up with getting equivalent uh, proportion of fraction of cells from every cluster, uh, you know, from all over the places. Whereas here, you put more stress on subtypes which are rare, and so on and so forth. As you increase, then it slowly swamps the entire population. So it doesn't. You cannot differentiate much here. Okay, so we also develop another concept and it is very hard for me to explain that how these concepts came together to make a, a, a software switch, but I can give you the basic glimpses of uh, some of these important considerations that we met while developing this method. We also noticed that one of the one of the most used methods, uh, which is called principal component analysis, right, uh, uh, for dimensional reduction in genomic data, it has a very basic problem. Uh, if you have this kind of a, just just a hypothetical uh, you know uh, case study here, so you have the red cells, you have the blue cells. Now imagine that if you look at the highest uh, the direction of the highest variability, then of course this is the direction of the highest variability, right? And then you have the PC two. So the PC one is the direction of the highest variability. Then you have an orthogonal uh, axis uh, on top of it, which is PC two. But it so turns out that if you project all the green cells and the uh, uh, and the red cells on the pc1 if you take a dot product then you'll be they will be uh, not separable at all right for example they look like lump right so if you for example consider pc1 very seriously if you consider pc1 very seriously then you'll end up not getting the important cells of populations right whereas if you just consider this the direction of the principal component two then interesting in spite of having less variability along this direction you'll end up getting the two sub subpopulations precisely and, and that's uh, that's something that we noted. And then we uh, sort of considered uh, uh, a new method by which you can simply use a Gaussian mixture model to identify the different modalities along the principal components, right? So for instance, the top panel is very significant uh, and, and quite uh, interesting, uh, where you'll see that the principal component one, two, three, four, so this is the the, the, the light blue shows you what happens if you just plot uh, the PC1, PC2 and subsequent principal components in terms of their variance, right? So, so as, as you take the later principal components, the variance captured by it is less, right? Whereas if you look at the number of modes, number of this, um, you know, humps, right? Number of these humps, like in this case, it is two. So if you just simply count that, now don't get into what method is used for doing so, okay? So we simply used, uh, in the first version, we used something called Gaussian mixture model. In the second version, we used splines, uh, beta splines and all that. Th th that's too technical, right? So if you just focus on this top figure, it basically shows you the number of modes does not necessarily correlate with uh, the, the, the sequence of the principal components, right? Although towards the, initial part, you'll see that the initial principal components have higher chances of having multiple modes, whereas it fades away as you go towards the tail of this uh, this, this picture, right? And that, uh, that sort of gives a lot of confidence that it's a better thing to do, that you consider the principal components uh, by the number of modes they represent and not by the variance they capture, right? And that sort of, so for example, the top principal components in terms of the variance will be one, two, and three, where you can see that the cells are pretty clumped, right? The different cells of populations which are known earlier, if you mark their distribution along after projections of the cells on the principal component one, two, and three, then you'll see that they're sort of clumped up together, right? Whereas if you see here, they're well parsed out, right? So which is, they, they, they have a lot of gaps in between them and therefore it becomes very easy. They don't get sort of interfered with each other, right? So that's another consideration. And with all that, uh, we ended up, uh, and of course, the locality sensitive hashing that I spoke about for discovering nearest neighbors very, very rapidly is something, I mean, taken all together, we ended up getting a very good accuracy when it compared with fact sorted, uh, you know, subpopulation, um, you know, of PBMC and we matched whether our annotations, whether our clusters mimic the real annotations of the, 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 the blood cell subtypes. And as you can see, one measure, 
of uh, you know comparing your clusters with the annotations is measuring the adjusted RAND index. And in terms of that, we have a higher RAND index on the PBMC data. And of course, what we have more is the less memory consumption because a lot of these things are in memory operations for taking the matrix, you know, creating this nearest neighbor, you know, uh, matrices and uh, so on and so forth. It's a lot of memory hungry processes are involved in that. As you can also see in seconds, the, 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 the number of seconds taken for executing these algorithms, you can see there's a, a drop plus turns out to be a clear winner. Now, one important observation was that when we throw these 68,000 blood cells um, onto this algorithm, then we discover a particularly interesting subpopulation, regulatory T cells, right? Regulatory T cells is a one, one uh, very interesting kind of a T cells, right? Which, which actually has uh, interesting properties in the context of cancer. They turn out to be pro-cancer instead of, you know, uh, anti-cancer. Right, so so it's very important to identify and characterize this subpopulation because they otherwise get mixed up with the other uh, kinds of the CD4 T cells. Right, so you can see at that point in time, the state of the art methods, uh, Seward and Ranger, uh, gave us much sort of uh, I would say mixed up kind of a representation of all these different cell types, whereas it's pretty cleaner on the left hand side, which is drop plus. So I'll just skip some of these ideas, but we developed a rank best algorithm for um, batch effect removal in single cells. And uh, that again, yielded uh, fantastic results. So these are, uh, these are the cell lines. Uh, these are all lung cancer cell lines, lung adenocarcinoma cell lines, uh, uh, you know, distinct cell lines, and they are processed in two different batches. So as you can see this, um, the symbols, uh, it's not super clear though. I mean, there are three three different symbols, right? The square, the cross and the circle, right? So the symbols represent the batches in which the, the single cells were processed, right? And the colors represent the cell line that we're working with, right? And as you can see, the uncorrected case, it's a, it's a very, uh, you know, bad kind of a picture because a lot of same kind of cells are getting sort of uh, parted. Right. Whereas if you use drop class, it's a pretty neat integration of the different, uh, you know, uh, cell types uh, in a batch resolved manner. Right. And this is absolutely important to do an integrative analysis of genomic data. And the closest, um, you know, method to us was CIRAT. Uh, uh, and uh, but, but as you can see, it's still not as as clean as ours, right? And of course, we have different ways of measuring how clean it is, but the visual is enough to identify what's going on here. So we had a publication in 2018 in Nucleic Acid Research from my group in collaboration with Sangamitra uh, uh, from ISI, who happens to be my supervisor as well. And back-to-back, uh, -back, uh, you know, not back-to-back, -back, you know, after after one, uh, two years of uh, work, uh, we published another paper in bioinformatics, you know, talking about the batch effect removal policy. Okay. And the same um, technique, which is uh, uh, providing a zip code to a cell was used to achieve another objective, which was pretty hard those times, right? I mean, if, even the human cell atlas project was not unfolded. Um, and it was still in the in a very inception phase, and we decided what happens if tomorrow there is a you know explosion of single cell uh, uh, profiling data following Moore's law, and and sort of reverse maybe, <laughs> and and then um, we thought what happens if you want to sort of search a particular kind of an expression profile in a large atlas of cells, right, which is by combining data sets from different labs, different uh, geographies, uh, whatnot, right? So we basically used, uh, again, some kind of a hashing algorithm. I'm not getting into the technical nitty gritties, but I'm just showing you what we achieved with it. Uh, uh, it's, it's basically combining the power of the graphical processing unit, GPU, with locality sensitive hashing. Because in the end of the day, the locality sensitive hashing, what I described, to begin my talk is uh, you know, a bunch of matrix multiplications, which can be easily achieved on top of a GPU much faster than CPU, right? So we created a, a GPU powered server for single cell search 
uh, when I published our, uh, the paper in the end of 2018, or the middle of 2018, we had this many cells, like uh, quarter to, I mean, of almost three lakhs uh, of cells, uh, right? Bulk and single cells, both. And this is the architecture of it. So again, you query an expression profile. The query is binned uh, because what locality sensitive hashing does is it basically creates multiple buckets, right? Uh, with identical bit vectors, right? And we just assign, so these are zip codes essentially. And that zip code is shared not by a single expression profile. That zip code is shared by many, many expression profiles that could be bulk, that could be single cells. But at the end of the day, when you fire a query on your server, then this query profile actually lands in one of these beans and you get a result that what are the similar cells, right? Or the similar, you know, expression profiles. This is how the server looks like. You can check it out, it's still online. Um, and we achieved, uh, uh, you know, uh, good badge effect removal simply because we can actually measure similarity uh, of a given query cell with a lot of other cells. There, thereby, you can, instead of looking at the gene expression-based clustering, if you, if you just take the cell projection on the other expression profiles in terms of, let's say, cosine distance or something, then uh, it turns out to be uh, a meta information that helps sort of uh, merge your cells uh, more accurately. This paper was published in 2018 in nucleic acids again, uh, and the collaborator was Bibor, who is a colleague in my department, works on epigenomics. And both the first authors are now planted in uh, the University of Lausanne. And, um, uh, you know, they are the master students that did thesis with us. Uh, well, okay, so, so now we, sort of stumbled across this very interesting problem that how we can identify the rare cells. So one of the objectives of carrying out a single cell sequencing uh, study is to be able to find out something that you have not seen in the past, something which is not well characterized. That could be cancer stem cells, that could be one particular type of a neuron, that could be anything, that could be circulating tumor cells. Right now, how do you find it? It's, it's finding a needle in a haystack, in the, you know, and, and it's computationally challenging. In computer science terms or machine learning, data mining terms, you can think of it as an outlier detection or anomaly detection, right? The same problem. So what we did here was again, as I told you in the beginning, is we built on one idea for the last almost three years, and then we gave up. We, we went ahead with statistics and more mathematical stuff, but, this locality sensitive hashing was the workhorse for this algorithm as well. And here I'll go a bit slow because this is interesting. And this is this is one of the fastest and best algorithm to date for doing this rare cell discovery in single cells. OK, uh, so what it does is it take the single cell expression vectors, right? And as you can see, I have given them different colors, but in single cell data, the colors are not known a priori until you do the analysis. Because you have a bunch of cells, you don't know what cells are they, unless some biologist uh, tells you that, okay, looks like given the differentially expressed upregulated, downregulated genes, this is what the cell looks like, okay? That, that, that's very subjective, but what you essentially initially have is a bunch of cells, right? And the bunch could be really, really large, right? Now, we have just annotated, we have given this them fictitious, uh, uh, you know, category names here, rare cell type one, rare cell type two, abundant type one, abundant type two, abundant type three, right? So what, again, what this hashing does is basically it creates bit vectors out of the cells. And then each bit vector is like a zip code, which is shared by multiple households, right? Let's say thousands of cells share a single bit code. So that's a box. That's why we came up with this representation of this multi-celled column, right? And um, a mul multi-cubicle column, right? That just means that every cubicle has a, a a uh, precise hash code, which is identical for all the data points that ultimately end up landing there. And of course, one reason they land together in the same cubicle is that they are similar. But you cannot do it once because remember, 
it is an approximate process. It's a randomized algorithm. So it's an approximate process. So we'll have to we'll have to take into account what happens if it doesn't capture, if only one instance of hashing does not capture the cell similarity space, right? And therefore we had to do this hashing process multiple times, right? As many as hundred times, let's say. And that is very, very fast, conspicuously fast, okay? Just because you are doing a bunch of matrix multiplications, which you can even further accelerate using GPU. And thereby we came up with a pseudo just let me check the time because I tend to speak much. Okay, so um, so uh, as you can see here, the for example the the pink colored cells, which is abundant cell type two, they they tend to share the same no matter in which way you do the hashing, right? Um, you know you end up landing. There is a high chance that you'll end up two cells if they share their lineage, they will land in the same box, same cubicle. Right. Just think of this analogy. There are there's the big hall, right? And there's a party going on in that. And there are hundreds of people. And there are certain clusters of people, right? Um, uh, you know, they have formed groups. They're discussing. They're you know exchanging ideas in a scientific conference, whatever. Right. Now all of a sudden, some walls, random walls pop pop up in that room right in the hall right? then what will happen so the chances are very high then some cubicles will get formed some n number of cubicles will get formed and the chance of you being separated from if from your friend to whom you are talking will be less right because no matter how this walls pop up right it, it is unlikely uh, relatively unlikely to cut you and your friend uh, apart Okay, and and that's the logic. That is the philosophy. Yeah. Okay. So what we do here is that just by counting the number of data points, or the number of cells lying in the same cubicle, or assign the same, sharing the same identical zip code, you can actually compute a probability. That is total number of cells in this cubicle divided by total number of cells, overall number of cells. This large pile, that gives you a probability. Right, so each cell is assigned that identical empirical probability that you compute, okay? And then each cell for every column, every every time I hash them, you will get one probability value attached to one cell. So if you do 100 times this hashing, this collection of this hyperplanes, then you end up getting 100 uh, probability, surrogates of probability. It's not really probability, it's basically a, a number between zero to one that tells you that how, you know, whether you belong to a crowded place or whether you belong to sort of a, a sparsely dense, uh, you know, population. Okay. And then what you can do is you can use Fisher score, right, uh, to, to combine this probability values. Now, this statistically has to follow uh, chi square distribution. However, there are a lot of considerations. We don't call it is it a statistic. It's just a score. Just, just consider it in that merit, right? In that spirit. Okay. It's not a matrix. It's 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 a score, right? Because there are a lot of factors uh, um, other than you know there are a lot of considerations uh, while while you compute the Fisher scores otherwise. But what the score basically does is it it, it combines this probability values. Uh, you know, sort of obtained from this different random hashings. And then it assigns you a combined score, a one score to every cell, right? And the rare cell tends to have the higher score. And the more abundant cells, right? Um, you know, the larger subpopulations like T cells would typically end up getting a low score, right? So it essentially assigns a gradient of scores to all the cells, right? And now it's your choice that how rare is rare to you, right? Whether you want to work with the top five cells or top 50 cells, you can choose, right? It, it, you have complete flexibility. Uh, well, so there's a misplaced slide here, if I just skip. So here's an example of what happens when you run this algorithm on the same data that I showed a couple of minutes back. 68,000 PBMC cells. PBMCs, 
and the gray uh, background represent all of that. And then when I just consider the top 0.25% of the cells that it, it sort of lights up only megakaryocytes and maybe some dendritic cells here. Very, very little traces of that. Okay, now as you light up further, as you go for 2% of it, then you get to see dendritic cells, CD14 monocytes, uh, some of the subpopulations of monocytes, and uh, of course the megakaryocytes, which you anyway discovered uh, even with 0.25%, right? And so on and so forth. As you increase, then you get to see the other cell support. So it's a very, very powerful, it, it really works in a matter of seconds, like sub minute algorithm okay no matter how big is your data up to 100000 cells it will work within a minute and at, at that point of time before we introduced um, um, until we introduced this method there was no method that scaled such large volumes of data right um, and we did a lot of validation of the same we we looked at simulated data with jacut cells so jacut is a t lymphoblast lymphocyte cell line right and we sort of created a simulation with uh, you know smaller number of jacut cells and a larger number of 293 t another cell line and sort of we could detect that pretty accurately so this is a real picture the colors represent the cell types right and uh, uh, and then how the other algorithms work okay so how these different algorithms like fire this is fire this is race id it's a nature paper and this is Gini class i don't know what it does is a local outlier factor something like that it's a, it's a pretty good method by the way the local outlier factor worked well it's a data mining method we also found with the same method a rare subpopulation of mouse brain cells okay in the hypothalamus and it's called it's a subtype of parse tuberulis so we used uh, published data of uh, you know mouse hypothalamus and we used our algorithm to find the the most rare cell subpopulations of the cells we don't care about the subpopulations we just pick up the top cells in terms of the fire score and then we did the d analysis we found this unspoken cell type parse tuber 1c which was completely unknown in fact the author of the paper who published this data 20,000 cells right did not talk about the same and it had a clear uh, you know sort of we, we found evidence of that cell uh, belonging to the place from where the sequencing was done right and we used allen brain atlas uh, and the in-situ images from that to see sort of uh, what are these cells, okay? Where the cells lie. And we did a similar experiments on dendritic cells, right? There was a science paper published in 2017. What they did was they fact sorted the dendritic cells, right, with some known markers, right? And then did clustering to find out four, five different subpopulations of the dendritic cells. If you just do take the entire PBMC, the dendritic cell concentration of the number of dendritic cells that you get will be minuscule. And from that, you will not be able to identify the different subpopulations of the dendritic cells. So what we did was we demonstrated that the fire is so powerful that even if you use it on the 68K, 68,000 PBMC data, you should be able to identify the different subpopulations of the dendritic cells. Okay, so these are the clusters of the top selected, let's say 2% of the cells that we took, we just did a clustering, we found these clusters, and then uh, some of the clusters were, you know, marked as dendritic cells from an independent data, right, uh, using uh, enriched fact sorted, uh, you know, major cell types in PBMC. So they just did it for annotation of the cells. It was a completely independent data. So they annotated all the 68,000 cells into 11 known cell types of PBMC. And then what we found was at least four of the clusters we could retrieve uh, with very small number of dendritic cells. I don't recall the exact number, but as you can see, each column is a, each column is a dendritic cell. 
these are the these are the uh, differential genes the the upregulated genes for each subtype of the dendritic cell cluster look at the dc4 right so dc4 is literally very small uh, and it, it matched very well with what these guys reported in the science paper it came in 2017 so we published this in nature communications um, in 2018 december uh, and it was a great collaboration with Jayadeva, who is the head of the department of uh, IIT Delhi Electrical Engineering Department, as a very good collaborator. We have multiple studies published together. Ashi and Prashant were the co first authors of the paper. And so, right now, they are wrapping up their thesis and working in a company. Well, this is the final big thing that I will talk about. And then I'll, okay, 440. Okay, so we very recently uh, picked up a very traditional you know, genomics, transcriptomics problem, which is finding out the differential genes. Again, in the context of single cells, finding differential genes is very challenging. Just because you have too much of dropouts, there are so many other uh, technical factors that influence the way you get the single cell expression readouts, right? Uh, it's very difficult to identify. So just look at this figure, okay? So this is the, this is the distribution of the gene expression in um, you know, bulk samples, right? Some uh, brain subpopulation, brain cell subpopulation, I don't really recollect what was it. It was, I think, oligodendrocytes or something. And then from the same population, if you uh, get single cells, sorry, this is differentiating myoblasts, sorry, muscle cells, okay? So if you look at the bulk replicates at zero hour, 24 hours into differentiation, you see that they're pretty homogeneous, reproducible, right? Whereas if you look at the single cells, they look very, very divergent. You know, there's very wiggly nature, right, of the gene expression distribution. And the same is true for the number of genes expressed is also very, very variable, not only less, but highly variable, right? And this is still better. These numbers are still better. Nowadays, you have very, very shallow sequencing, uh, which is typically done for the single cell in, in our uh, projects because the sequencing cost is much high. Although, uh, you know, detection of the isolation of the single cells is inexpensive, sequencing is very expensive, okay? So as you all know, the differential gene expression analysis, what you are supposed to do is, we have some clusters of cells that we have identified. We want to identify the markers of the cells. It's a very fundamental problem. Every time you have a data, you want to understand what are the genes, right, that mark each cell subpopulation. It's also done in the case of bulk expression analysis. So we stumbled across this wonderful paper in PLOS One. And here, the authors uh, demonstrated this ex interesting distribution, right, um, uh, which they called rank order distribution. Uh, it's, it's a generalized version of the beta distribution, right, where they say that, look, even if you look at the pieces of art, right, you'll see that the, the, the size of the rank right are distributed uh, you know are explained through a beta distribution very easily okay and that is very very reproducible so it's almost i, I was so am amused by this work i i thought it is something uh, very powerful as maybe more powerful than uh, normal distribution right so um so we sort of started you know playing around it so this is very simple. So uh, on the left hand side, you have the rank of, of a gene, right? And uh, this is the total number of cells in a particular group, right? It's a normalized, A is a capital A is a normalization factor. Um, R is the rank of the gene, sorry. Y, R is the expression value, the frequency of the, the number of molecules, number of detected molecules, or the number of copies of the gene in the cell. And R is the rank of it, and you have two parameters as uh, you have commonly in case of beta distribution, right? So this is the this is the modified uh, beta distribution, and what we did was we we sort of fitted the parameters in a group specific manner. For example, you have two clusters, you are looking at a gene, you can measure the values of A and B in the two groups, right? Um, um, uh, through maximum likelihood estimation. Right, and you can develop a world-like test statistic for measuring the divergence of these parameters, right, and how significant they are. So we sort of found that the modeling is um, uh, pretty decent, right? Uh, I know I'm running a bit fast, but it's just that, um, you know, I think I'm reaching the end of the, 
you know the time given to me so you can, so you can conclude in 5 minutes if possible yeah 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 i'll conclude in 5 minutes definitely so yes so we sort of got a very good uh, you know it's a discrete distribution by the way because it has to deal with ranks i am from my phd time i am very obsessed with ranks and and it's very robust and this is the first time and, and, and the problem with ranks is that people think that ranks is lossy so i just wanted to break that dogma right i i thought this i demonstrate that ranks are related if ranks can be related with the absolute expression or the absolute values then it could be very powerful maybe it could be more powerful so i found a way between uh, ranks and parametric um, you know statistics right so so we sort of used maximum likelihood estimation to measure the to estimate the values of a and b for the different groups and then we we sort of created a world uh, like test uh, where the variance is estimated using the fisher's information matrix and we used ground truth information to cross compare our prediction of d genes differentially expressed genes across different different data sets like nine different data sets this is our own data set where we took the fibroblasts and k562 cancer cell line and we sort of had a bulk replicates of the same from the bulk replicates we found the d genes and non d genes and we sort of compared whether our identification of the differentially expressed genes are concordant with what we identified from the bulk rna seq experiments because bulk rna seq experiments are much more robust because there you pool the cells right and here you don't really care for heterogeneity uh, roughly because it's a homogeneous cell you know population of cell line right and if we really don't care about your uh, the sort of sanctity of your ground truth you you trust that the cell lines are homogeneous which may not be true it, in fact it is not true in many cases well so there are many results uh, i can keep showing but i'll just move over it i mean this this work better with dropouts this work very very fast okay um and we just recently got this paper accepted in genome research and uh, um it is a collaboration with the author names are not shown here it's from my lab my collaborator was an indian statistical institute abhik ghosh was an assistant professor in um the bayesian statistics unit or something like that uh, i size my alma mater by the way and of course we have a lot of people from at least three different continents so this is um, uh, this is the most recent uh, publication uh, one of the most recent publications from our group um finally and and this is kind of um, just to intrigue you guys right because so far whatever i have spoken about are pretty standard there's nothing new it's just different methods mambo jumbos right but what we have started working on is an interesting idea that instead of looking at the ups and downs of the genes can we define a cell through the lenses of mrna processing kinetics okay i am not a systems biologist okay so don't ask me questions from that so we just solved some kinetic equations to estimate the um, you know the rate of um, transcription and degradation so it's basically a production so the simple way to understand is that the mrna gets produced right you know as a nascent rna molecule and then they get spliced and then they get degraded right so if you simply rna seq experiments will actually cover both the nascent rna and the mature rna right so without any introns right so if you just take those sequences which have introns attached to it uh, in you know some intronic reads attached to it then you can say this is coming from the nascent rna molecule and if you look at the processed one then they will not find the introns right so what people have done this is not what we have done this is taken from another paper sorry i have not mentioned i have not cited that it's from liar factors uh, you know some limelight article in molecular cell on as a coverage of uh, cover story of this rna velocity work published by uh, peter karchenko of harvard university this is not my work so don't misunderstand okay so what it tells is that if the production and the decay are leveled in a cell then we can call it homeostasis right and if the 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 degradation is more than the production then it's a disbalance and it's disbalanced too in case the production is more than you know spending right that is decay right so which you can measure 
with uh, intronic, you know, RNA molecules, uh, copies of RNA with the intronic reads in it and copies of RNA molecules without intronic reads in it. Okay, and that is a super cool application. And this is, I think, one of the best uh, computational biology papers that I have seen in the last 10 years, frankly speaking. And what it does is it takes single cells, it measures the quantity of the processed RNA and unprocessed RNA. And your unprocessed RNA is the future of the cell, right? The nascent RNA, the ones that are reflected by the, the, the RNA molecules, which have the intronic reads attached to them, that actually indicates the future of the cell. So you can actually predict, given a cell, you can predict its future by looking at the reporter of the nascent RNA, which can be estimated from the same RNA-seq data. Okay, and you can actually delineate the entire uh, differentiation trajectory for any organ system or tissue, right? This is for pancreas. That is remarkable, remarkable. It is just a significant development in developmental biology and every other field for that matter. So what we did was we sort of created a, a matrix called, so nobody really used this homeostasis in the context of aging, right? So we used, we tried to use it in the context of aging because aging is often understood as the, you know, the, the, the decay in homeostasis. So this is a schematic saying that, you know, as your cells grow old, right? There is a degradation in this balance between the, you know, production and the decay of the RNA molecules. So we just created a measure that can, um, we created a score that can actually measure this disbalance, right? And we showed that it precisely, you know, at, uh, you know, so, so these are the different decades, pancreas cells again, right? Is the HDS score. You can see the distribution here right so the balance so you can understand hds as the balance between these two so it captures the extent of homeostasis in a cell subpopulation and for one of the cell types of pancreas which is alpha cells we have shown and and also for other cells uh, you know in the supplementary figures it's uh, it's a new study it's under you know it's it's under review right now so we have demonstrated how the homeostasis can be used as a method to examine the biological edge of the cells, right? And uh, and we found breakdown genes. That means the genes which have higher homeostasis at uh, earlier decades and lower homeostasis going forward. That's one. But nobody has ever talked about restoration. Does restoration happen? Yes, it happens. Technically, yes. I, I have limited wet lab expertise, right? I just do wet lab by convincing uh, biologists, right? Uh, these days it's going on fine, but otherwise I, you know, I, I just don't do too much of wet lab. So otherwise I would have gone down proving this restoration genes, right? And, uh, you know, we have some anecdotal results suggesting that with fasting and all, you can actually have the the restoration mechanism uh, kicking in, right? So anyway, I'll not spend much time here. So I talked about hashing. I talked about how you should, uh, you know, uh, play with non-parametric methods. How sh should you play with ranks, right? I mean, from, it's purely method development perspective, right? Um, and, you know, the importance of the hash families and order statistics, so on and so forth. I mean, they give you speed, they give you accuracy uh, and uh, precise delineation and characterization of uh, specific cell types. So my group has developed a lot of methods, um, you know, independently. I mean, these are all where we led the study uh, and there are many other where we, we helped others building stuff. These are some of the acknowledgements. So I was, too tired to make a uh, acknowledgement, you know, to update my acknowledgement uh, page. My supervisor is a good collaborator. Naveen is the R&D head of uh, Fluidime in US. Stephanie Jeffrey is a key opinion leader in breast cancer, Stanford. Jadeva, IIT Gaurav is a colleague at IIIT Ritu, um, cancer, you know, person, and lab oncology head in Ames. 
and several other students. I think Devajyoti was the first author of Drop Cluster, uh, you know, Krishan Rosek, Genome Research first author, Prashant Ashi, Nature Communication first author, Divyangshu, Nucleic Acids first author, Cell Atlas Search, and other uh, lab mates, uh, Chitrita and Smriti as well. But there are many other which I have not acknowledged here simply because I didn't have time. I'm really, really sorry if you're listening to my talk, okay? I sort of am funded by, so my lab is a poor lab, okay? Essentially as a dry lab. So, however, I have received funding from uh, important government agencies and I'm sort of thankful to them. I worked with, I have been always working with companies. I lo love uh, building products. Uh, that's a different story. That will take another two, uh, two hours. But uh, Care Onco Biotech is a liquid biopsy company that we have founded in Delhi helping in early cancer diagnosis. We have done a technology transfer to the company. We are soon hitting um, the road. Okay, so we are, we are going to get a indigenous liquid biopsy product out soon. That's it from my side and I'm open for taking any questions. Design uh, machine uh, learning algorithms. How do you take care of limitations in single cell RNA sequencing, including bias of transcript coverage, low capture efficiency, and sequencing coverage result. So how do you actually go about that? Yeah, yeah so th this is a very good question. I think there, there are a lot of ways, normalization techniques that you'll have to use to sort of, because what happens is the single cells, each cell is a sample, right? So there is a huge cell to cell variability of the number of detected genes, the number of dropouts, and that could happen for many, many reasons like differential reagent concentration, the size of the cell, the health of the cell, whatever, right? You can think of n different reasons for that happening. So I think it's a matter of picking up the right uh, normalization uh, technique. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, even a simple quantile normalization, although it's a very aggressive normalization, it helps. People don't use it these days for the single cells, but, um, uh, but I have seen in my hands, no, even quantile normalization, which is very aggressive, that works very well in case of uh, huge data variability. But there are other scaling-based methods also these days, uh, which are working fine, primarily with the advent of 10x genomics platforms, uh, the three prime sequencing and all. I think the data is coming pretty clean, I would say. Uh, uh, however, I think there are other methods. You should look at our Nature Genetics paper in 2017. What we did was we projected the cells uh, from the gene expression space into a pathway enrichment space. Okay, so mm -hmm. so so a gene expression matrix could be genes versus cells. If I have pathway versus cells, and then you measure the you convert into pathway versus cell, and 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 you measure the pathway enrichment in terms of single sample enrichment analysis like GSVA, you should get uh, a lot of I would say uh, much better uh, you know uh, clustering uh, outcome. So yes, so it's uh, it's tricky. It's it's surely tricky, but there are many methods. I'll it, it will take me another twenty minutes to explain what okay. are the different methods. Okay, I think one very relevant question, and that's the last question that I'll take for the day. Has single cell transcriptomics been used to study COVID immunobiology? Uh, well, I'm uh, yes, I guess yes. I'm I'm not a a uh, virology guy or immun immunologist, but I have seen uh, many papers on that. The people have done PBMCs. In fact, there are papers published in Cell uh, where people have done PBMC RNA sequencing and from that they have found viral read integration at a single cell resolution. Uh, extraordinary uh, volumes of study have been published uh, in um, a context of single cell PBMCs and um, all that. So we have also, in collaboration with Gaurav's lab, uh, published a, a paper on COVID where we have demonstrated that, uh, uh, you know, which cell type in nasal epithelia uh, has the, the right kind of in, ingredients to sort of do a handshake with the COVID. Okay. And so thereby, we sort of explained the cellular basis of the loss of smell in COVID uh, patients. And this is one of the uh, early studies to explain the the rationale. So, yeah. So, that's. Thank you. Thank you. That was a really interesting uh, insight, and we'll definitely write back to you to get a hand at that publication and definitely share it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Devarka Singhupta, for the uh, wonderful insights that you have shared with us. 
uh, and uh, uh, you know all the results that you have shared with your publications. There was so much to learn from your uh, session. I'm sure we are going to be inviting you uh, again to discuss more of your work. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, this is for all those who have joined us on YouTube and on our uh, Facebook page and as well as in the Zoom link. Uh, please do uh, fill in the feedback form um, for the link for which has been provided in the chat window. And uh, recordings of all the sessions are available on YouTube. So you can access them and uh, whenever you have time, you can view them. Also, we'd like to uh, let you know that uh, our next session is going to be uh, hosted on the 10th of June. And Dr. Lippi Tukral uh, from CSIR IGIB will be addressing the session. So uh, thanks from the entire Manav team, uh, uh, you know, who has joined us to put up this session. Uh, and thank you to you, sir, for having enlightened us. And uh, with those words... Thanks I a will, lot, um, yeah, yeah, Dr. Anupama. Looking yeah. forward to meet you again. Bye. Sure, sure. Thank you, sir. And take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.